So without further ado, we um, we are very honored to have Dr. David Montgomery uh, here with us this afternoon. Um, he'll be talking about growing a revolution, bringing our soil back to health. Growing a revolution cuts through debates about conventional and organic farming, showing how all soil health revolution could bring farming soil back to life. Combining ancient wisdom with modern science, Montgomery offers a vision where agriculture becomes a solution to environmental problems, helping feed us all and cool the planet. Dr. David Montgomery is a Mark Arthur Fellow and Professor of Geomorphology at University of Washington. He is an internationally recognized geologist who studies landscape evolution and the effects of geologic processes on ecological systems and human societies, and author of award-winning popular science books, which he has here today that he will sign for you, and you can purchase right here. Um, He's also been featured in documentary film, networks, cable TV, and a wide variety of TV and radio programs, um, including Nova, PBS, NewsHour, Fox and Friends, All Things Considered, etc. He lives in Seattle, um, and actually started out in Portland this morning, so thank you so much for making that effort to come out. He woke up earlier than me and I have an infant child, um, so that says a lot. He lives in Seattle with his wife, Anne, and their black guide dog dropout named Loki. So welcome to the stage, Dr. David Montgomery. Hey, uh, Monica, uh, thank you, and thank you for the invitation to come up to Whatcom County. Can everybody in the back hear me? We're good. Are we good with, we're good, all right. Um, yeah, what I'm going to talk to you about today is essentially what uh, my wife Anne and I call our Dirt Trilogy, because uh, 10 years ago when I first wrote that Dirt book, uh, I never would have imagined that 10 years on, I would have written three books about soil, but uh, the more I got into it, the more interesting it was and the more things unfolded. So this first book, Dirt, is really a, the kind of book you might expect a geologist to write about soil. It looks backwards through history and looks at the effect of how people have treated the land how that affected human societies over the course of the last 10,000 years. Uh, this middle book, um, whoops, The Hidden Half of Nature, talks much more about the role of microbial life in soil fertility. It's the part that Anne and I were not taught in graduate school about soil science that we really should have, about the importance of soil biology in soil fertility. And what we've learned in the last 20 years about connecting those dots and what it means for agriculture and medicine. Uh, and the third book, Growing a Revolution, the one that the title, the one that the title has today, all right, I'm getting good signs from the back. Um, that one is more about how to apply the lessons from dirt and the insights from the hidden half of nature to the practical problem of how to restore soil fertility at scale through the, as a consequence of intensive farming. Um, so if the first 15 minutes or so of this talk is kind of depressing, don't worry. <laughs> it will be. <laughs> but what I'd like to do is take you through my own intellectual journey and going from a bit of a pessimist about the way the future of farming and the future of land to how I became a bona fide optimist uh, as, cattle, as, as written about in that Growing a Revolution book. But first, because I'm an academic, I get to start with a pop quiz. Which planet would you rather live on? <laughs> yes, there is a right answer. <laughs> yeah, everyone, who votes for the one on the left? That blue one. How about the one on the right, Mars? Nobody? All right, well, everybody passes. Um, you know, when we think about what makes for a habitable planet, you know, water usually comes to the top of the list. That's what defines the habitable zone in terms of looking at other kinds of solar systems for habitable planets. Um, we also know about the atmosphere. You know, we're blessed with a planet that has an oxygen-rich atmosphere that our biology is not coincidentally well adapted to. But there's a third piece that often gets left off the table, and that's we only know of one planet in the universe so far that has soil. Soil is the merger of geology and biology, and at least so far we don't know of other planets that have life. We know that there's soil on this planet. And that's the natural resource that we tend to take much more for granted than those other ones, the atmosphere or water. Uh, and this is a, a global problem. If you look today at um, the UN's map of the state of the world's soils, notice all this red and yellow area, which covers most of the inhabited world, are areas where our agricultural lands have been degraded to some extent in terms of their ability to produce food. 
This is kind of a sobering map. There's a lot of dark red areas on it. But what I'll we'll get to by the end is that if you go to any, almost any of those red areas on this map, you can find farms that are actually turning the story that's apparent on this map around 180 degrees and are building fertility of their land and restoring and repairing the productivity of their land as a consequence of farming. Um, as I said, it would be a little depressing at the start. If we put actual numbers on that map, we start to go a little lower in the sense that if we look at the amount of land that humanity has lost to agricultural production since the Second World War, it's about a third of our cropland. Some 430 million hectares of arable land has been taken out of production since the Second World War. That's an area the size of China and India combined, and it's as a result of soil loss and soil degradation. Those are kind of sobering numbers. And if you look at the most recent report I can find, well, there's actually one that just came out in November, I haven't integrated in the PowerPoint yet, but it basically makes the same point. That back in the UN's State of the Soil Assessment in 2015, um, they noted that we're losing 0.3% of our agricultural production capacity at a global scale each and every year to ongoing soil degradation and soil loss. Now, 0.3%, that kind of sounds like a small number, right? That's about what we're all getting in our savings accounts. <laughs> but if you play that out for 100 years, it's another third, another 30% of our agricultural production capacity. In other words, we're on track at the moment. If we keep going the way that we have been, that by the year 2100, when we're projected to have more than 10 billion people on the planet, we'll be down to one-third of the agricultural of productivity that we could have had at the end of the last ice age. Think about those curves. Those, those things are in conflict with one another. Um, this is the kind of problem that I talked about in the Dirt Book, where I basically looked backwards at the role of land use uh, and uh, its effects on soil and soil fertility through different societies, and what was the basic storyline? Well, when you look back into that, you find a very similar story in many societies around the world that soil erosion and soil degradation really influenced the longevity of civilizations. And it goes back all the way to Neolithic Europe, uh, Bronze Age Europe. You can find areas where intensive agriculture was practiced then that are no longer fertile because of the treatment of the land. Classical Greece, there's areas, there's hillsides in southern Greece that are now bare rocky slopes that have Bronze Age agricultural implements that you can find in places where you couldn't possibly grow wheat because there's no soil left. Um, the Roman Empire, um, a great story in central Italy. Has anyone ever been to the, the famous uh, port of ancient Rome, Ostia, in Italy? How close to the, to the ocean is it anymore? You can't even see the sea from it because the soil has been washed down from the hills and out into the Mediterranean. The southern United States, Central America, there's more societies that I could go into that where the problem of soil erosion greatly affected the, the, the fate of those societies. But if you look back at environmental history textbooks, the answer that you find as to what caused that soil erosion is almost always deforestation. And if you crunch the numbers, particularly in the Northwest, they simply just don't add up to the kind of wholesale loss of the topsoil that could explain the denudation of entire regions of their soil cover. Because the landslides that can happen when you clear cut a steep slope happen on a tiny fraction of the landscape. They can impact the rivers and streams greatly because streams come together down slope. But the numbers just don't pencil out for the acts to have been the culprit in the destruction of soils in ancient societies. Uh, and as I started researching the, the dirt book, what I got into is realizing there was another culprit. It was the plow. It was the plow that followed the axe that resulted in the wholesale loss of the soil off of regions in the ancient world. Now, why would that be? Well, think about what the plow actually does. In inverting the soil, you're creating a blank slate, you're getting rid of vegetation at the surface, and it leaves the ground bare and vulnerable to erosion by wind or rain in the, in the, the wake of the plow. And soil erosion can occur at a pace that's greatly in excess of the rate that soil is rebuilt. And if you think about soil as a system, something that's made from rocks and it's uh, the mixture of rocks and organic matter, sort of the marriage of geology and biology, um, 
soils take some time to form, and nature does it actually very slowly. I'll show you some numbers on that in a few minutes. Um, but if you think about something that is actually made and something that can be lost, when soil is eroded off of a farm field, it goes somewhere else. It's not destroyed as matter, but it doesn't stay where it was made. And you think about the thickness of the soil on a landscape as essentially reflecting that balance or imbalance between the rate of production of soil from rocks and, and integration with biology and the loss of soil from erosion. We know that if you eroded the soil faster than you're rebuilding it, you're literally running out of it. It's just like a bank account. If you spend money faster than you put it in the bank, uh, you're basically burning through your savings. And I know from personal experience that if you do this for long enough, you can drive it, that number down to zero. So what is it? Well, I mean, this is the oldest image that we have of a plow. Uh, it's from uh, Mesopotamia. I like it because it looks a little weird. It looks like you have yamas with space aliens following them around. Um, but it's not. That's the, from the medium of rolled baked clay. Uh, but the key thing is, is that the problem of the plow for societies in the past has been that it allowed soils to erode faster than they were formed. And if that plays out over multiple generations, even though it's slow, it adds up because it's unidirectional. This is a picture I like to use uh, from the Palouse over in eastern Washington to illustrate why a geologist like myself would look at the problem of a, a freshly plowed field as sort of a disaster waiting to happen. Uh, particularly if you're on any kind of a slope, and these are fairly steep slopes. This is a winter wheat field, and you'll notice there's no crop on it. Rain fell shortly after plowing, all these little channels got cut into it, all that soil sort of heading down and starting its journey down to the ocean. Uh, and I look at this and go, this is just the landscape you know, bleeding out um, in, in plain sight. How much do these little channels that can happen after a single rainstorm add up over time? I mean, these could be plowed over with a single pass of a, of a plow, single pass of a tractor, uh, and erased. But if they keep forming year after year, they can really add up. Uh, this is another picture from the Palouse taken by Vern Kaiser back in 1961. What it shows you is essentially what the magnitude of that problem can be. This fence up here is a fence that the farmer um, constructed around his water cistern back in 1911 when this field was first plowed. Uh, and by 1961, this cliff had developed on the edge of that field. And you can find similar sort of fence row cliffs in Iowa, you can find them in the Palouse, in places that have fairly loose and erodible soils. Um, and, but how high is that cliff? You can't really see it. There's a bit of a, a, a black line there that is the, there's a survey rod that's sitting in there. It's kind of washed out in the negative, but that's a five foot cliff. This is five feet of soil erosion in 50 years. That means about a foot every decade, which translates to roughly an inch a year. There is nowhere on earth that soils form that fast, except my wife's garden, and perhaps your farm. Nature doesn't build soils at a pace that can keep up with that. But one of the things that turned me from a pessimist, the way you may be sitting here looking at these slides, into a real optimist, is by learning from farmers who had actually figured out the recipe for building soils back really fast. It's so fast that a geologist would be you know, kind of incredulous and have to go visit them to figure out whether they were actually telling me the truth or not. Uh, I was incredibly impressed uh, with the, the stories of the farmers that I visit, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, you should also be sitting there thinking that, isn't that a pretty extreme example? Well, of course it is. That's why I use it. <laughs> How typical is it? That was like one farm, one corner of one farm in one example. Well, let's expand our scope now to a whole region of the United States. Let's look at the southeastern United States. So from Virginia up here down to Alabama, that gray noodle up there is the Piedmont or hill country. So it's not the lowland coastal plains, it's not the spine of the Appalachians, it's the rolling hill country that was one of the original breadbaskets of the American colonies. Uh, and then what this shows you is the magnitude of historical soil erosion in that region. So, you know, erosion from circa early 1600s through today. And it shows you that 4 to 10 inches have been eroded off most of the region, more than 10 inches in some areas. Um, well, how big a deal was that? If you go back and read the original journals of some of the farmers that were and plantation owners that were first working this land, they only had 6 to 12 inches of rich black earth to begin with. In other words, we've managed to erode off virtually the entire topsoil across a region of our country that was once one of our main agricultural um, centers. And we've done it in just a couple hundred years. 
Think what the Greeks could have done with the thousand year run at, at southern Greece, or the Romans could have done with the 800 year run at central Italy. Think what happened in Syria. It's not exactly the place we think of as an agricultural powerhouse, let alone as an area of stability today. There's ruins in Syria where the foundations stand a good several feet above the bare bedrock, and people don't build foundations above ground. You dig into the earth to build a foundation. Some areas of Syria have wholesale lost their soil. So soil loss has been a big problem for certain societies around the world. Um, and in this area, pretty much the entire topsoil has been eroded off over pretty broad areas. You can go out to farms in this region and their farm, the farmers are working the subsoil. And that only works really well if you add a whole lot of fertilizer to it. You can still grow crops in it, but you have to bring the nutrition to the party because the really nutri uh, fertile part of the soil is the topsoil, not the subsoil. And the real insidious part of soil erosion is that it removes stuff from the top. It take, gets rid of the best stuff first. Um, and it's, it's a little light in here for this slide, but I'm hoping you can see that there's a bit of a difference between this soil and that soil. Uh, what this is, is this is from a tobacco plantation in Northern, North Carolina that I went to visit with uh, the TV show Nova uh, when they called me up and basically said they had this three-part special they were making called Making North America and they were getting to the end of production and realized they did not have anything on soil yet in the film. And they were trying to tell the whole story of North America and what could we do in like two or three minutes that would tell the story of soil in North America for the last you know, 100 million years. Um, and what I decided is like, we should go to one of these tobacco plantations on the eastern seaboard uh, in that Piedmont country and just dig a hole in the field and look at the nature of the soil that was in a conventional agricultural field and then go into the forest next door that was an abandoned farm that this had been let to go back to nature for a century. I'll just dig a hole, throw it on a white tablecloth and see if there's any difference. The difference is that this looks like beach sand, khaki beach sand. Um, this looks like sort of milk chocolate with a lot of organic matter in it. This is a lot more fertile than this. We've managed to basically turn the world's farmland from soils that have stuff like this to stuff like this in a few, in only about a century of conventional agriculture. This is to remind me to tell you that there's two problems with soil degradation. One is the loss of the soil, like I mentioned in Syria. The other is the loss of soil organic matter because soil organic matter is sort of the fuel that drives the fertility of the land. And if you look at the most recent estimates for how much organic matter we've lost off of farm fields in North America, it's about half in the last couple hundred years. You look globally, same number, about half. That's not a trend that can go on for a long time without making us utterly dependent on artificial fertility. Um, so how typical were the kind of numbers that I was showing you? Uh, one of the things that I got into in, in writing the dirt book was uh, the, the fact that there's, if you look at ancient societies and the way that the land treated them based on how they treated their land, nobody was collecting data. There were no scientists recording sediment flux off of Roman farm fields. There were no regulators going out and looking at the nitrogen load in the streams. Uh, you have to reconstruct it out of our, the archaeological world. So I wanted to actually also ask the question of if I, if I was starting to think that, that tillage, that plow-based agriculture, had resulted in a wholesale loss of the soil off of large regions of the planet, um, do the numbers we have today from monitoring farms actually pencil out and support that? So I, I basically went to the library, gathered all the data that I could find on how fast are the world's farms eroding, and how fast does nature build soils, and how fast um, does erosion occur under natural systems. And I'm going to boil that data all down to this one table. It's the only sort of data table that I'll show you. Um, if you're interested in the numbers that are behind this and the science behind it, there's a paper under my name, Montgomery, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2007. There's an Excel spreadsheet that has all 1,400 studies that I compiled to produce this graph listed there. You don't have, no one ever has to do this research again. You can just go download my spreadsheet and start from there. Um, the numbers on the left are the kinds of things I was measuring. The numbers on the right were the median or the average number that I came up with from all those studies. The numbers in parentheses are the number of peer-reviewed academic studies that went to the averaging to create the number on the right. So you'll notice there's a, there's a fair amount of work involved there. The big story, though, is the difference between that red number and the blue numbers. That red number is the average rate at which the world's farmland is eroding under conventional tillage-based agriculture. 
and you'll notice it's about a millimeter and a half a year. That's pretty slow, unless you're a geologist. Your fingernails grow faster than that. The San Andreas Fault moves faster than that. Soil erosion is a slow process when you average it over time, but it adds up. The bad news is that these blue numbers down here, the erosion rate under native vegetation, the rate that nature produces soils, and the long-term geological rates of erosion, they're all down a couple percent of a millimeter a year. In other words, they're 10 to 100 times slower than contemporary soil erosion off of the world's agricultural fields. That's the imbalance. That's basically the curse of the plow. The good news on this graph is the number I haven't talked about yet, the erosion rate in no-till agriculture. It's a blue up there because it's a lot like those other blue numbers. In other words, the problem with soil erosion is not that we farm. The problem has been how we have been farming over the history and where we've been applying technologies like the plow. Um, so, so far I've given you the numbers that, you, that uh, it takes to basically calculate for yourself what you would expect the longevity of an agricultural civilization to be. So let's, well, let's walk through the numbers. It's kind of one of those back of the envelope calculations. Uh, we've seen that the net loss of soil from agricultural fields is on the order of a millimeter a year. That's conservative. I could have argued for a millimeter and a half. Let's just go for a millimeter. Uh, it makes the math easy. Uh, a typical half meter to one meter thick or a one to three foot thick hillside soil uh, would erode in roughly 500 to 1,000 years. That turns out, if you read in the dirt book, that's about the average longevity of agricultural civilizations around the world, with some really important exceptions. And those exceptions are the societies that develop on major river floodplains, where farming using tillage has been stable for thousands of years. Places like in the Nile, in the Nile Delta, the, the, the Tigris and the Euphrates in, um, uh, in Mesopotamia, the Indus and the Brahmaputra in India, and the big rivers of lowland China draining off the east side of the Tibetan Plateau. These are societies that manage to farm long term using the kind of technology that I've argued is very erosive. How did they do it? Well, the key is that they're in a floodplain. What happens on floodplains? They flood. And if you allow the sediments that are in the floodwaters to settle on a floodplain, it only how, how thick is a sand grain? One to two millimeters is medium to coarse grain sand. In other words, you can deposit a single grain of sand each year on a field in a floodplain and completely offset the average pace of topsoil erosion from tillage-based agriculture. In other words, you could farm a floodplain for a long time with a plow and it'd probably be okay as long as you let it flood to replenish the soil. But where do you find some of the most um, destitute societies uh, through history? In the headwaters of those same rivers in Somalia and Ethiopia on the Nile, in Syria, in Mesopotamia, in the Himalaya, in, um, in India, and in the, the original seat of Chinese agriculture in the, the eastern uh, Tibetan plateau. These are areas whose soil was lost and ended up subsidizing their downstream neighbors and their stability. This kind of the exception, in other words, that helps prove the rule that they ill-advised nature of tillage-based agriculture on any kind of a system outside of a floodplain. Okay, n now we get to the point where we can ask the question of, oh, do we have to do this at a global scale, or can we turn this around? And if the answer was that we were doomed to basically do this at a global scale, I would probably not be still writing books and talking about this stuff. I'd be hiding in my basement with a barrel of scotch. <laughs> can we reverse this problem? I think we can, and I think we can do it remarkably fast. And the place that I started to learn how to do that was actually in my own yard. Because as I was finishing writing that dirt book, um, my wife was transforming the soil in our yard. We live in North Seattle, um, either Wallingford or Green Lake, if you're familiar with the terrain down there, depending on which neighborhood plan you read, they both claim our neighborhood. Um, and we bought a house back in the late 90s, and Anne was wanting a place where she could build the garden we could never have in student housing and in apartments and so forth, because she's a biologist. And it's not a coincidence that we wrote this book about the nature of soil fertility, because I'm a geologist, she's a biologist, what makes for fertile soil? Combination. Um, when we bought our house, um, it came with a side yard, as so many places in North Seattle used to have before we built skinny houses on all of them. Um, and this is the neighbor's house back there that I'll come back in in a minute. But what I want to really point out here is that when we 
peeled the old growth Seattle lawn that came on the side yard off, we didn't find a single worm. What we found, though, was this beautiful, rich, fertile black earth that North Seattle is so well known for. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, we, <laughs> we had glacial till, nature's concrete. It was horrible soil. It was crap soil. It, was, it had almost no organic matter, less than 1% of organic matter. And as I said, not a single worm. We didn't see a single macroscopic life form in that soil. It's probably okay to call that soil dirt. This was not acceptable to Anne, um, and she realized that what we had was we had my half of the equation. We had the geology, we had the mineral matter for fertile soil. What we didn't have was the biology. We didn't have her part. Uh, so she went on what we call in the book her organic matter crusade, basically trying to find all the organic matter she could from local sources in North Seattle. She painted up her wheelbarrow, because that makes it go faster, right? Um, <laughs> And we started adding things like uh, wood chips to, to mulch the, the yard. Uh, the you know, arborists really love it when they know that your driveway is a safe place to dump all the chips that they chipped out in the yard, and we, and we loved it. Uh, Anne would, would take the wheelbarrow over to the neighbors and rake up their oak leaves in the fall and bring them back to our yard. And it's a great way to build relationships with the neighbors in a city is, hey, we'll rake your yard, but we want the leaves. What they don't realize is we should have been paying them for the nutrients they were letting us import off of their land back into our yard. And there's, uh, it's, people heard of something called zoo do. Some, some nods in the audience. The, the Seattle Zoo produces a lot of zoo do. Or I should say the herbivores at the Seattle Zoo produce the raw material that they compost into zoo do. And we've started entering the zoo do lottery. And we won and filled my truck up with a load of zoo do to bring back to the yard. And then we entered again and we won again. And we entered again and we won again. <laughs> We kind of started to get the feeling that we always win the Zoo Lottery. Because <laughs> they apparently have a lot to get rid of. Um, but in adding all that organic matter to the yard, uh, you know, we were originally doing it simply to try and keep moisture in the soil and to rebuild a bit of fertility. I wish in hindsight we treated it as a scientific experiment and measured everything all along the way, but this is what, not what we were trying to do. We were just trying to make a garden. After about three years, we started to notice that our soil was changing color. It was no longer that khaki color of that I showed you when we peeled the lawn off. It was starting to actually get a bit of a dark brown. This shows you the pit that we dug about three, three to four years into feeding the soil. Down here, we still have that glacial till. We didn't, we didn't roto-till, we didn't disturb, we were kind of lazy. We just kept adding organic matter, building from the top down, and it would disappear. We'd add it in the fall, be gone in the spring, so we'd add more. Anne was basically thinking, we can, if the soil's hungry, we'll feed it. We'll just keep giving it organic matter. We didn't, at that time, understand a lot about where it was all going. But it was disappearing, and the nature of our soil was changing, because you see the sort of organic matter we've added here at the top by her pruning shears. There's about two inches of halfway decent soil that have formed in three to five years on that horrible, nasty till. Now, if you can do Two inches in five years, that's four inches in a decade, that's about a meter in a hundred years. That's enough to fully offset the kind of pictures I was showing you from the police. This is a pace that's beating nature at her own game in terms of the pace of soil production. What was the key? Well, labor, obviously, and organic matter, and basically adding the part that we didn't have. This is the soil that we started with, this is the soil we have today. Uh, this is less than 1% organic matter. This is about 10% organic matter. We've managed to sequester about eight tons of carbon in our yard, basically through gardening practices that were motivated simply by the desire to have a nice, beautiful garden. We also put in vegetable beds. We've been growing a bunch of our own food in the summer. Um, but this transition is something that I never would have imagined could happen that fast when I was in graduate school. This should have taken centuries if you just let nature run her course of doing it. But we can re restore and rebuild our soils far faster. Um, we did it in our yard, that resulted in an explosion of life above ground, and in the city, having a green wall between you and your neighbors is actually really a nice thing. I was not all that thrilled with watching their children grow up. Um, much better relations with the neighbors when they're behind a green screen. Um, and got the garden that she really wanted, but we also then started to look into, well, how did this soil rebuild so fast? How were we able to transform the soil you know, on a decade kind of a time scale? We, the more we looked into this, the more we realized that we weren't really the ones doing all the work. 
Most of the work was being done by microorganisms, by bacteria and fungi in the soil, by life in the soil, the life that we couldn't see with our own senses, but that we were feeding with all that organic matter. Now we all know um, about how plants will capture carbon dioxide and mix it with water to build their, the carbohydrate backbones of their bodies. Um, but the thing that we're not really taught, and then that Ann and I were not taught in graduate school soil science classes, was that plants will also take up to 30 to 40 percent of the material they photosynthesize and they'll push it out of their roots into the soil. We were taught that roots were straws that sucked up nutrients from the soil and it was the soluble component of what was available in the, in the, in the soil that actually was feeding and nourishing our plants. It turns out roots are two-way streets. Plants are pushing out things into the soil, things we call exudates because they're exuded out into the soil. What are those, what are those exudates? Simple sugars? Hormones, proteins, there's even a paper that came out last spring that showed that plants were pushing lipids, fats, out of their roots into the soil. What are fats, proteins, and carbohydrates? That's a meal, that's food, that's nourishment. Plants are pushing nourishment out of their roots into the soil. They're not doing it just to be friendly. And they're not doing it to be wasteful. Nature is brutally efficient. They're doing it because it makes sense for them. And what they're doing is they're feeding the life that lives around the root system of themselves in a zone that's known as the rhizosphere, which is literally just Greek for zone around the roots of a plant. That's some of the most life-dense areas on the planet. We tend to think of like the Amazon or the Serengeti as places that are really biodiverse and richer life. Think again. The root systems of plants are incredibly diverse and plants are feeding the microorganisms in the soil with a cocktail of exudates that are meant to recruit particular organisms to live around their roots because those organisms do things that benefit the plants. When you blow up the tip of a root in the rhizosphere and you look at the nature of what's happening, that plants are pushing exudates out into the soil, those exudates don't get very far. Studies have shown they get about a millimeter about the thickness of my thumbnail to a centimeter, about the length of my thumbnail, away from the root before they're eaten. Because there's so much life living around the roots. All those exudates are rapidly consumed. And what does any organism do with what it consumes? It metabolizes it. You change it from one form into another, gather nutrition or energy or, or use out of it, and then you excrete the remains, the, the metabolites, the waste. What kind of things are those bacteria making in the soil? What blew Anne in my mind when we started researching this is that some of those bacteria are making plant growth promoting hormones for those specific plants. And think about that for a minute. If you've got bacteria that are actually producing growth hormones for a plant, they're producing a growth hormone for a species in a completely different kingdom of life. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you think about it in isolation. But when you think about it in terms of the system, the bacteria are consuming the exudates that the plant's making with its monopoly on photosynthesis. They're pushing those nutrients out into the soil and the, the organisms in the soil are making things that benefit the plant. That is what Anne and I termed the original underground economy. And it is basically this, a biological bazaar where microbes and plants are trading nutrients, metabolites, and exudates. They're symbiotic relationships. The organisms in the soil are helping promote the health and growth of the plants growing in that soil. And if you look back through geologic history, you look at the earliest examples we have of land plants from 450 some odd million years ago, they have mycorrhizal fungi wrapped around their roots. These symbioses, these relationships between the soil life and plants are as old as plants are on land. Mycorrhizal fungi can actually partner with plants, send their, their hyphae out into the soil where they, we've, it's been documented that they can grab things like individual phosphorus atoms, bring them back, tray them to the plant for sugars. They're acting as root extensions that help unlock the nutrition that's in soil particles, stuff that would never show up on your soil tests because it's tied up in the mineral structure of the soil particles. It's not soluble unless you have mycorrhizal fungi to go get that stuff. In other words, soil life is a big component of soil fertility. It's the part that I wasn't taught in graduate school. What this means is we can think about the health of, of a plant in sort of different ways. And before I started working on this book with Anne, um, I didn't really think about plants having a diet. I thought about plants in my diet. 
not about what they were eating and how important that was. And so we can think of, if you have a plan, if you think through this, the, the, the lens of this underground economy, these, these symbiotic relationships in the rhizosphere, if you take a plant and you grow it on a, what Ann and I call the fertilizer diet, so you give it all the macronutrients that the plant needs to grow big. And you can grow big crops on poor soil if you add enough fertilizer. What you'll do is you'll grow a plant that has a, a um, doesn't invest so much in its root system. We sort of uh, term it that they become couch potato crops. They're being spoon-fed what they need for big growth. Why then invest in these exudates? That's energetically really expensive for a plant. And if they're if they're getting most of the macronutrients they need, they don't they could they dial back at their exudate production, which means they're not putting out as much exudate. They're not recruiting as many of the microbial uh, partners that they have in the soil. They will get fewer micronutrients and fewer of the beneficial microbial metabolites that actually help promote the health and growth of the, uh, the health of the plant. This is a fairly simple explanation for why the, the global demand for pesticides went through the roof after the global use of chemical fertilizers went through the roof. We dismantled the defensive systems of our crops. The soil health diet, on the other hand, uh, is uh, when plants are grown in a um, uh, healthy organic matter rich soil that has lots of microorganisms, they put out a lot of exudates, they'll get more micronutrients, more of the beneficial metabolites. It's a recipe for growing in healthier plants. Um, this all led me to think, okay, well, if this works well in a garden in urban Seattle, could you actually do it on a farm? Now, our house is not the place to demonstrate that. Um, and I'm a geologist, I'm not an agronomist. How would I basically answer that? Well, I chose to basically take some time off from UW, um, from teaching duties there, and visit farmers around the world who'd already restored fertility to their land, and ask them how'd they do it. You know, and then bring a shovel along, so I can dig a hole in their fields, and dig a hole in their neighbor's fields, look for myself, I can judge soil health and soil fertility. Um, but what I wanted to do was to ask farmers who had actually already demonstrated the power of restoring uh, fertility to their land, how they did it, and to search for the commonalities between those examples. And what I found, uh, I'll, I'll, int I'll introduce you to a few of those farmers in a minute, but what I found was a very simple set of principles underpinned the, all the examples that I found of farmers who had very rapidly rebuilt the soil on their farms, kind of done to their farms what Ann did to our yard, um, and those three principles turned out to be the principles of conservation agriculture. I'll tell you what those are in a moment, but basically what I found is that farmers who had rebuilt the health of their soil by adopting the principles of conservation agriculture could actually produce, match the yields of conventional farmers in their neighborhood, but they would do so using far less diesel and far less chemical inputs, which resulted in boom, same income, less expense. It was a recipe for restoring for profitability to the farms that I visited. That's what really started turning me into, into an optimist. Because if there's ways now to actually farm that could rebuild the health and fertility of our land, they're actually better for farmers as well, that's a recipe for broader adoption. So what are those general principles? There's three of them, and they're pretty simple. Don't disturb the soil. This would be no-till farming or direct planting of seeds, um, minimizing the disturbance of the soil. Maintain a permanent ground cover. You know, don't have bare earth. Keep the ground covered with cover crops in between cash crops. Always have a living plant growing on the soil. And diversifying crop rotations. Having at least three or four crops in rotation instead of one or two. These three simple principles are a recipe for cultivating the beneficial soil life. All these little microbes that I have in the slide as well. Um, if you think about how you would cultivate beneficial life in the soil, you don't disturb them, you provide them with organic matter to feed them, and you basically have a diversity of, of, of plants in your rotation to both get a diversity of mineral elements out of the soil, but also so that you're not um, encouraging pathogen establishment. Like if you grow corn in the same field year after year, what you're doing is you're basically creating a grocery store for things that eat corn. Having a diversity in your rotation that's unpredictable in timing and has at least three or four crops in it is a great way to outsmart pests and pathogens using ecological principles in the scientific, not the advocacy uh, sense. 
So how would you do that? Oh, this is a no-till planter that a farmer named David Brandt from Ohio, I'll show you again in a minute, is sort of demonstrating here. Uh, it's just a um, planter that goes um, you know, behind a tractor. There's a, a, um, a wheel that digs a little trench. Seeds drop down into it, and the closing wheels seal it back up. The reason I show it to you is to show you this slide over here on the right, because I followed behind him as he was planting a field in Ohio, uh, and you'll notice that you know, this is a freshly planted field. Con contrast the nature of that surface to what I was showing you in the Palouse. This is hardly disturbed at all. Rain could fall on this, and it's going to find no toehold to actually grab soil particles. You would have find no erosion on it. You could even do this on a decently steep hill, and you wouldn't have much erosion on it. Um, so technology, new equipment, is one of the things that actually allows us to um, pursue this idea of no-till farming. One of the things I go into in the book is that you'll actually hear a lot of people argue that, well, if you go no-till, you actually have to use a lot of herbicide along with it. That's not true. How do I know that? I visit farmers who have other means of controlling weeds, whether through their cover crops or their rotations or mechanical devices like this roller crimper that Jeff Moyer from the Rodale Institute is modeling. Uh, and it's basically a device that you can take out, uh, put on the back of a tractor, you know, put, I'm sorry, put on the front of the tractor with your no-tool planter on the back, and you can use the, the roller crimper to mow down your co last, the cover crop that um, was covering a field uh, as you then plant the next cash crop into it. And the crimper basically takes those cover crops, crushes their stems, thereby killing them, and as that cover crop rots, all the mineral elements and the nutrients that it brought out of the soil and captured from the atmosphere then rot and become food for the microbes that help support your plants. In other words, the cover crop turns into fertilizer. And I'll show you examples of four farmers that I visited uh, before I wrap up. Uh, and this guy's a guy named Dwayne Beck. He runs the Dakota Lakes Research Farm in, outside of Pierre, South Dakota. I visited him because the cover of the dirt book, which is one of those classic photos of you know, farm machinery in the dust bowl with you know, dust blowing over it, that's in his neighborhood. And I wanted to see what's changed since the 1930s. And I went there and he took me on a 200 mile tour of farms around um, his research farm where they had all converted, and they'd almost all converted to no-till. You notice there's no bare ground. They've got cover crops going, there's no bare ground, they retain their crop residue, um, and they were able to um, really transform it. They stopped the black dust from blowing. And what did they do? By adopting no-till cover crops and compost rotations, they reduced their diesel, fertilizer, and pesticide use by more than half. That was a huge savings to them. They also increased their yields. Soybean yields went up, corn yields went up. So they were growing more by using less. What changed? Their practices, the way they were treating the soil. I basically asked Wayne, um, you know, and the farms, these farms were reaching up to 20,000 acres in scale. These are not small farms. These are large scale industrialized mechanized farms. Um, I then asked him about you know, the idea of applying these same principles um, in Africa on small subsistence farms. And he suggested I go visit this gentleman here, Kofi Boa, notice his hat, got dirt, get soil. I kind of knew I would like him when I got out of the car and saw that was his hat. Um, he's working with farmers who, you know, the average farm size is about the size of the little area that we're in today. Uh, this building would be a huge farm for them. Um, and they're all subsistence farmers. Uh, they're growing six to eight different crops in their fields at once. They get their diversity in by having multiple crops in the same ground all at once, different canopy levels. What they did is that Kofi converted them from their traditional slash and burn to doing no-till with cover crops. That managed to reduce erosion by about a factor of 20. It took it down to basically background rates. It basically stopped soil erosion, uh, which had been wildly degrading their land. Uh, and what happened to their crop yields? Their corn yields tripled, their cowpea yields doubled. In other words, they didn't have the kind of yield increases that we saw with the Green Revolution in the developed world, but they did it on subsistence farms, and this method works a lot better than the Green Revolution methods for a very simple reason. These farmers don't have any money. They can't buy fertilizer. You got a fertilizer crop that needs intensive fertilization, not available to them. They can't buy herbicide. What they can do is change their practices. So going to no-till, integrating cover crops, and diversifying what they're growing in a field all at once, they transformed the economics of their region. It worked really well. David Brandt, who I uh, introduced earlier, is a farmer in uh, um, uh, Carroll, Ohio. 
he considers himself a bit of a rancher, but you can't see his livestock. They're invisible. They're microbes. This is what he feeds them. He sells corn, soybeans, and wheat, but he's got a fourth component of his rotation, and that's diverse cover crop mixes that involve a lot of radishes. It's one of his favorite cover crops. Uh, I told him what we'd sell that for in the farmer's market in Seattle, and he was like, no, no, you can't have that. That feeds my microbes. Notice his neighbor's field and his field. Grant's field, this is what his, his diverse cover crop mix. His neighbors, the yellow stuff, uh, soybeans, the green stuff are uh, glyphosate resistant mare's tail. They're weeds. Up to a quarter of his neighbor's fields are covered by weeds you cannot kill with a chemical. That's what greatly influenced his neighbor's productivity. So when you, you compare the economics of uh, his neighbor's farms to, to Brant's farms, his neighbors, they're using full tillage, they burn a lot of diesel, uh, they're applying 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre, two and a half quarts of Roundup. Um, you know, the total, total cost, uh, 500 bucks an acre, their yield is about 100 bushels an acre, they were getting four dollars a bushel that year. In other words, they were losing 100 bucks an acre. Even an academic geologist can tell you that sucks as a business model. <laughs> the harder you work, the more money you lose. The year that this happened, 25% of the farmers in Iowa lost money on every acre they planted in conventional crops. Why? Their input costs were high and the price they were getting for their crop was low. They're squeezed in the middle. How did Brandt do? He did really well the same year growing the same crops. He's been doing no-till for 44 years with, with cover crops now for a decade or two. He's got, he does not till, so he, doesn't, he burns half the diesel as his neighbors. He uses an eighth of the nitrogen and a fifth of the glyphosate. He's not an organic farmer. I started teasing him that he was organic-ish because he was hardly any, using any chemicals anymore. Had that pencil out for him? He was um, spending 320 bucks an acre. He had an 80% higher yield than his conventional neighbors, he was making 400 bucks an acre at the same price. That's a better business model. His neighbors, astoundingly to me, don't seem to be paying attention. He's got a new truck, and he's doing very well. Um, and he's a bit perplexed by that too. Um, the last farmer I'll tell you about is a guy named Gabe Brown, who is out of Bismarck, North Dakota. He's had a lot of media in the last couple of years because he's billing himself as a regenerative farmer. And he's been using real livestock that you can see, cows, to rebuild the health and fertility of his soils, which is something that when I was in graduate school, I would have told you, no, 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 cows are bad, they cause erosion. What I realized after visiting Gabe's farm is that it's not the cows that are bad, it's the way we've been grazing them that was bad. And he's using intensive rotational grazing that can actually rebuild soil organic matter and the fertility of the land in ways that really impressed me. He's bringing his cows in to graze off his cover crop. So he's not using one of those roller crimpers that Jeff Moyer was using. He's using his cattle to come in, graze off the cover crops and the crop stubble from previous harvest. And he's using them as an accelerant for the recycling of the nutrients that were in the cover crops. And he, you know, that's, he's also got a chicken business where that they're uh, grazing off the, the nasties that are in the cow patties. Um, but what I really wanted to show you is what's happened to Gabe's soil. One of these hands is holding his soil from his neighbor's organic farm. The other is holding Gabe's soil. That's the organic farm, that's Gabe's soil. Kind of reminds you of the difference of our yard before and after. He's rebuilt the organic matter in his soil to be higher than the native soil of the plains. He's made it better, more fertile than nature did. And he did it by managing, through ecological principles, nutrient cycling and building up organic matter. Uh, and what was wrong with the, the neighboring organic farm? It's tillage based. They plow a lot. And that makes a big difference. What's the recipe that was, I was basically able to identify based on uh, the, the experience of these farmers I visited? Three simple ideas. Ditch the plow, cover up with cover crops, and grow with diversity. Figuring out the practices to implement in a different region, like here, for example, is the challenge. You wouldn't use the methods Kofi Boa used in Ghana. You wouldn't use exactly what Gabe Brown is using in the Dakotas. But these three principles seem to translate across the board as ways to build healthy, fertile soil. You know, and plus or minus livestock. You also may notice that this is 180 degree opposite 
of the philosophy that we practiced in conventional agriculture for most of the 20th century, where we used intensive tillage, lots of fertilizer, and we grew one or two things. This is a different way of thinking about the land, thinking about the soil, and its, its relation to agriculture. The kind of benefits that we can get out of it are we can maintain our yields while reducing fossil fuel, fertilizer, and pesticide use. We end up uh, having higher farmer profits, which is essential if you're going to keep farmers in business over the long run, which we all depend on. And we can increase the amount of carbon in the soil greatly. Um, it results in better water retention, which translates into crop resilience to, to, um, to drought and results in less off-site pollution. Um, basically, I don't see what the downsides are. Um, there's a lot of good news that can come out of this. It's not a question of organic versus conventional. I've not really weighed in on that. I visit the, uh, Rodale was an organic farm, the others were conventional farms. These ideas helped across the board. Where does this fit in history? Basically, we've had four agricultural revolutions so far, in my view. The, the idea of agriculture in the first place was absolutely revolutionary. The second agricultural revolution was the idea of planting legumes with crops, starting to rotate crops. Two of those three ideas in conservation agriculture are not new ideas, they are ancient wisdom. Crop rotations and, um, and cover cropping. Combining that with no-till is very new. And it's new technologies and the ways of thinking that allow us to do that. Um, the third agricultural revolution was the mechanization and industrialization that transformed agriculture in the 19th and 20th centuries. The fourth was the green revolution and biotechnology. I just lumped them all into one revolution because the one I'm excited about is the one I think that we're poised to embark upon. And that's the soil health revolution. The idea that thinking about the soil ecology as the foundation for productive farming and the way to rebuild fertility in the world's farmland, that is revolutionary. And if we could actually spread that across agriculture and turn conventional farms into organic-ish farms and turn organic farms into more sustainably organic farms, it would truly revolutionize agriculture. And that's what I'm really excited about when I'm talking about all this stuff. I've sort of gone over the benefits before that we would get by um, from the, embracing the concept of soil health as the next agricultural revolution, and I think I'm out of time, so I should stop there. Uh, I have, I did bring copies of three books. Uh, these these three books, if you're interested in them, come see me at the table. And if we run out of time for questions, um, we probably have time for a question or two. But if we have other questions, feel free to come ask me over there afterwards too. And I think you had your hand up first. Okay, and I'm going to try with this weak microphone. If you can talk pretty closely into it, thank you. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Thank you. So, um, you briefly alluded to um, this system reducing the need for pesticides because the plants have innate things going on with this system. I think that's what you were alluding to, um, in order to protect themselves from pesticides. So my question is, yeah. um, can you speak a little bit more about that? Talk about how it's been documented and, you know, I mean... Yes, there, that, that there's a great farm uh, and a web resource. It's called Blue Dasher Farm. It's run by a guy named Jonathan Lundgren. It's in South Dakota. He's an entomologist who has gone into farming, and he's basically using these principles and demonstrating their effects. One of the big problems with pesticides is that if you apply a blanket pesticide, you're killing 1,200 beneficial organisms for every pest you take out. Those beneficial organisms eat things like pests. And so, you know, if you create a blank slate, like if you just plow a field and don't plant anything, what comes back first? Weeds. Same thing with insects. You wipe them out, what comes back first? The pests. The predators that eat them come back later. Exactly. You've planted this great big field of food for the pests. And it takes a while to rebuild the predators. So uh, Jonathan Lundgren at Blue Dasher Farms is one of the leading intellectuals who is you know, documenting that. And he's got some really neat new studies that have, are comparing what's happening in the Midwest. I don't know of any from, from this region in particular. Um, but you know, sort of there's two avenues, two avenues. One, you're knocking out the beneficials, the predators. The other one is that um, if you disrupt the soil microbiome, the chemical signaling between the soil and the plant gets disrupted, and the natural defensive system of the plant, which is all chemistry-based, because you know, a plant can't get up and run away the way an herbivore can from a predator, a plant's defensive system either involves things like thorns or physical infrastructure that you know, we can't change this way. 
But the chemical signaling and the production of phytochemicals, the chemicals that the plants make, which actually help them repel insect herbivores, is very connected to the health of the soil. So if we, if we change the soil in a way that reduces their microbial allies that would help them uh, convey that signaling and change their own metabolism to build the compounds that will help repel pests, um, uh, we undermine their defensive system. And, and the third piece of it is, is if you have a life-filled soil, there's not no room at the trough for the pests. Literally, they get, they get eaten, they get out-competed. And one of the most replicated experiments in botany is growing plants in sterilized soil versus life-filled soil. The plants in the sterile soil succumb to pests rapidly. The plants in very life-rich soil uh, do very well. Now, it's not to say that uh, pests would never uh, attack a field, and that's where some of these organicish farmers that I dealt with, you know, they wanted to reserve the right that if their crop was being threatened by a pest partway through a cycle, they're going to nuke it. <laughs> um, but they're deeply invested in building their soil health as preventive medicine. And, and that's where some of my own thinking kind of evolved in talking with them. And so, yeah, flexibility may not be a bad thing. Pardon? Sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's been, yeah, exactly. It's like the human model, it's like antibiotics, it's like chemo, it's like there's a lot. Oh, the Cubans. Oh, well, there's parallels in agriculture and medicine, but there's also. Um, you know, I visited Cuba last November and talked with one of their agricultural ministers who basically, they were very interested in embarking on this idea of conservation ag at a national scale because they still have an awful lot of Soviet plows and the Russians really like to plow. And it, it kind of did a number on Cuba's soil, but in terms of how to ecologically manage soil life, they're kind of way ahead of us. Yeah, I think you were next. Or do you know much about biochar? Um, yeah, there's a chapter in Growing Revolution that talks about biochar in Central America. Uh, we have a little biochar stove, and I'm a pyromaniac, so I love it. Um, the key things in biochar are to worry about the source material. What biochar is, is it's, it's, it's organic matter that's been combusted in a low oxygen environment and turned into charcoal. So it's basically charcoal. Think of biochar as habitat for microorganisms. Um, it's usually not good food for them because it's been reduced too much to just carbon, but it makes for great habitat. Uh, and so if you have biochar in an organic matter rich soil, it's a recipe for fertility. Yes, yeah, so slash and burn is a way to create biochar. So you might ask, what was wrong with the slash and burn in, in Ghana? For slash and burn to work and be sustained, you sort of like clear a patch of forest, you burn it, that introduces charcoal to the ground, it also volatilizes some of your nutrients, so you lose a bit there. Um, but if you do it year after year, it degrades the organic matter in the soil. The way that, that slash and burn really works well is if you clear a little patch of land, farm it for two or three years, and then you move on to another place. And so there's like a 20 or 30 year rotation was very typical in indigenous societies around the world. The problem in Ghana is that they have uh, their population now is such that they have to keep farming the same land year after year, so their traditional methods just don't work because that key bit of moving it around is lost to them. So they needed to learn a different way of thinking about the land that Kofi basically, he's, he basically leapfrog, leapfrogged, if that's a verb, over the Green Revolution by teaching them how to care for the life in their soil. So. And there was one more, should we do one more question or are we out of time? Oh, okay. Oh, is this on? Loud. Not loud, okay. Oh, um, my stepfather was really into biodynamics and he was doing a lot of this stuff. Oh, yeah. And so can you compare and contrast the two? Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of biodynamic farming, the, those people have been on to some of these ideas and principles for a long time. And the idea of essentially cultivating the beneficial life in the soil, I mean, the biodynamic practices square really well with most of this. Um, there's other bits of history and other sort of thinking and, and um, practices in biodynamic that make no sense to me. But the basic idea, I think, is is very much in line with the ideas of conservation agriculture. I think they're, they're on a functional level, um, they're pretty similar. So I'm, we're actually going to go down and interview some biodynamic vintners in California this summer to try and look at, um, you know, to extend these ideas and thinking to non-grain kind of uh, crops. Okay, I have to talk really loud. Um, you know, I've been doing uh, no 
no-till permaculture on my property for four years. And one of the things maybe that should be added is that when you um, use no-till and you mulch, sheet mulch, and more plant cover crops, you don't have to weed. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it, I, I have uh, quite a large um, garden and I probably spent two hours last year um, and I was driven to no-till out of desperation <laughs> because my weeds were so were so difficult and I'm now getting to the point where I am I actually have excess soil. So, wow. yeah, so it is it's one Yeah, no that they um the time savings from some of the I write about all this stuff in Growing Revolution where some of the, the time savings is a big factor in Af both Africa and the US and you know, the no-till farmers that I visit, I didn't see any weeds on their property. Um, I would see cover crops, but then they would kill them. And there was this, uh, one told me this, uh, this great example of a, um, a farm where they had sort of a farm tour where farmers came from all around to visit this one farmer's uh, no-till fields. And they had a challenge, you know, we'll give you a dollar for every weed you find. He didn't have to pay. And he didn't pay a nickel. Um, and the conventional fields across the way, there were plenty of weeds. And, yeah, and, and the whole problem of, of herbicide-resistant weeds is, is, I think, going to help push the shift towards more and more of the sort of no-till practices in conjunction with non-glyphosate weed management.